Okay, hi everybody. Uh, it's 7.30, so let's get started now. And I have to apologize ahead of time because in the background, I have a very noisy parrot who does not have a mute button and I can't even move her out of the room into another one. So please bear with me um, with the background noise. And I am giving a new Stella. My parrot's name is Stella, by the way. Uh, I'm giving you new, the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And I wanna welcome you tonight to our talk, Protecting San Francisco Bay from Invasive Spartina. Um, but before we get started on uh, this introduction to the chapter and uh, the talk, I wanted to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS lies in the homeland of the Muwekma Ohlone the Amamutsan Tribal Band, the Tamyan Nation, and the Ramaytush Ohlone. This is land that was theirs for thousands of years and was taken forcibly from them. Despite two centuries of oppression and genocide, they still live and thrive in this area today. We acknowledge and respect them for their land stewardship, culture, language, and humanity. The Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS hopes to learn from them and supports their work to restore traditional practices and heal from historical trauma. Our talk tonight is not just me and the speakers. We actually have a team. So as I mentioned, I'm Vivian Nu. I'm the host. Um, we also have Madeline Morrow, who is going to be acting as our QA moderator. And behind the scenes, we have Shiho Amster, who is going to be watching uh, our YouTube chat and we'll be helping out there. And Madeline is also dealing with tech behind the scenes. And then of course we have our speakers, Jeannie Hammond and Lindsay Bay Dumicus. Uh, and if you are not familiar with CNPS, we are a nonprofit environmental organization. We were founded in 1965, have over 10,000 members in 35 chapters that are spread all over California and beyond the state's borders into Baja, California. Our chapter uh, covers Santa Clara Valley and wow, she's really noisy, I'm so sorry about that, um, and Southern San Mateo County. Um, our goal uh, as an organization is to save California's native plants and their habitats and we do that through science, education, and conservation and horticulture. If you are not currently a member, we would love to have you join us. Um, there's a lot of benefits. Uh, you get two wonderful journals, Artemisia, which is a scientific journal that gives you a lot of interesting information about native plants and science behind them. Uh, there's also Flora, which has a lighter touch, a um, lot of really great information about gardening, also features uh, some fun activities for kids. Um, you'll also receive our chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, which tells you about these events and also has interesting articles uh, relating to our area. And you get discounts at participating local nurseries. It's really easy to join. Just go to cnps.org uh, slash join. And there's a form there you can sign up online. So we would really love to have you join us. It helps support our work, um, these talks, and um, all the wonderful environmental work that the organization does. And we have a lot of great um, events coming up, um, a number of talks. So there's conservation of a rare redwood florist, forest um, coming up on the 21st. That was is with uh, Ben Carter. Container gardening with native plants uh, at the beginning of August. And then the following week, we'll have a virtual garden tour, the Salinger Garden, absolutely fabulous garden. And then I am extremely excited because our first in-person activity is going to be happening on August 7th, um, which will be a field trip to the Tilden Regional Park with Bart O'Brien, uh, the director, the park director, and also a former president of our chapter. Um, this is a, a, an activity that is only for CNPS members. So it's another reason that if you are not currently a member, you might want to join. Uh, when it, uh, we will have information about participating on that field trip uh, on our website shortly. So you are actually the 
people here are the first to hear about it. It's not even up on our website yet, but stay tuned uh, because it will be there, including information on signing up to attend that. And then uh, a week out or two after that, we'll have another virtual talk here, uh, Paintbrushes in Peril, Rare Castilla Species of North America, a talk by Mark Dager. He's uh, an amazing photographer, uh, just an expert at Castilla. That is gonna be a really great talk. So if you wanna stay in touch and learn about our events, you can always find them on our website, cnps-scv.org, on and our meetup group and if um, you are not on, oops, oops, did I go too far? Sorry, I, um, if you're not on our chapter news mailing list, that's another place that you can get a weekly message, just one message, letting you know about what's coming up. And you can find out how to join that list by going to our website, cnps-scv.org. We also have a nursery and currently we are on what we're calling restricted summer sales. So only for very large orders, 250 and above, but you can place your order online and we will bring the plants to you if, if you live between Belmont and San Jose. Um, and that's free delivery. So and all the proceeds go to support our chapter. Uh, and we also have t-shirts, books and other things in addition to plants. So please feel free to stop by online, cnps-scv.org, cnps-scv nursery, or just simply go to the website and there's a link right there at the top of the page um, to get you to our online nursery. Oh, and actually I have this slide backwards order. Uh, as I just mentioned, if you want a weekly reminder about our upcoming events, and we have a lot of things going on, um, like that field trip, I'm actually expecting that we are going to be scheduling more field trips. So if you want the latest and greatest, please make sure you are uh, on our chapter news mailing list because you'll just get a, a reminder once a week about that. And if you're enjoying these virtual events and you like Zoom or are comfortable with it, we would love to have help. Uh, it, we are looking for more QA moderators and YouTube moderators. All you have to really be able to do is use your keyboard and mouse, be able to switch between windows, be able to copy and paste, and we will teach you everything else you need to know. So if that sounds like something you'd like to help us with, um, you can contact Madeline. Her email address is right there on the screen, Madeline Morrow at earthlink.net. Uh, it's also on our website. So please get in touch if this sounds like something you would like to help us with. Now a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please mute your microphones if you're not already muted. You are welcome to ask questions at any point by typing them into the chat box. We have moderators who are watching both YouTube and uh, Zoom chat, and they will ask all the questions that are typed in uh, to, at the end of the talk. And we do expect to wrap up by nine o'clock. So tonight's program is Protecting San Francisco Bay from Invasive Spartina by Jeannie Hammond and Lindsay Faye Domicus. And uh, Jeannie is the Restoration Program Manager and Lindsay is uh, an environmental biologist, both with Olson Environmental. And they like to spend lots of time in tidal marshes. So they get down and dirty working on keeping the bay free of this invasive Spartina. They like to wear hip waders. Well, they sort of have to actually. Um, and their favorite work day is a day where they get to spend some time in a kayak. And as I mentioned, they love getting muddy, but they also like getting clean afterwards. So I'm turning it over to you, Jeannie and Lindsay. I'm really excited to have you here today and looking forward to hearing about all the work you've been doing. So go ahead and take it away. Great. I'm going to mute so you don't hear my parrot anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone uh, for joining Lindsay and I to learn a little bit about native and invasive Spartina in the San Francisco Bay Estuary. Um, uh, also, thanks to the Santa Clara Valley um, chapter for hosting us. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the Invasive Spartina Project, which is part of the State Coastal Conservancy. Um, and, oh, here we go. Same problem as before. I can't advance my slides. <laughs> Hold on, let me stop sharing and I'll try again. This happened last time we did this. Let's 
let's see. So, share screen. Second time's a charm, right? Okay, does everyone see the slides? Somebody nod their head. Perfect. Okay, let's see if I can advance. Yes! <laughs> Zoom is a constant marvel for me. <laughs> so before I talk about um, native and invasive Spartina, I wanted to talk a little bit about why native tidal salt marshes are important to us. So all of us, when we fly into San Francisco or Oakland airports, or we're whizzing across one of the bridges, San Mateo or Dunbarton bridges, uh, we've, I'm sure we've all noticed the sinuous blues and greens, or maybe the reds that you see in the salt ponds, or maybe even if you rolled your window down on a warm day, you smelled the sulfurous -y smell of the salt ponds. Um, all of those are part of our lovely tidal marsh, tidal marshes around San Francisco Bay. And the tidal marshes are super important to the health of San Francisco Bay, and for all of us humans who live, um, work, and play on the edges of the bay. Why are they important? Well, they're highly productive ecosystems rich in biodiversity. They're also important carbon sinks. So they're helpful, or hopefully they'll be helpful with us in combating climate change. Um, they can help protect coastal areas from natural disasters. Um, they act as a buffer from storm surges and also erosion. Uh, they're essentially the, the upper vegetated portion of mudflats. So when you're going across the bridge and you look out over the vast expanse of mudflats, sort of imagine at the very upper edges of those before you get to all of our houses and development and everything, that's where the tidal marshes are. Um, they're sandwiched between the marine and the terrestrial ecosystems. So they often provide the connection um, between saline and fresh waters, which means they're really critical habitat for a bunch of uh, many um, aquatic and terrestrial critters who feed shelter and um, breed in our tidal marshes. They also act as a high tide refuge for birds that are um, foraging in the adjacent mudflats. Um, and they provide to us valuable ecosystem services of significant commercial and recreational value. Um, one example uh, of that is water quality. Marshes are known to um, protect water quality by filtering contaminants from our urban runoff. So globally, 25 to 50, we've lost 25 to 50% of our tidal salt marshes to human development. Um, and I included this slide. Uh, it's a great graphic from the San Francisco Estuary Institute that shows tidal marsh extent historically and what we're dealing with now. So back in the 1800s, prior to colonization by us folks, um, we, there was about 200,000 acres of tidal marshes around San Francisco Bay. Um, we now have lost 85% of those tidal wetlands. And on the right side of the graphic, you can see in the really light green where the existing tidal marshes are left, the remnant tidal marshes that we have. And in the slightly darker green is restoration projects that have already happened. And then the darker green is future restoration projects. Um, we've gone from basically the 200,000 that we had to not very much, but the bay conservation community as a whole is uh, has a goal of restoring us back to about 100,000 acres of wetlands um, once we get all the projects you see on this graphic in place and up and running. Um, even having lost the 85% of those wetlands, um, San Francisco Bay Estuary is still the largest expanse of tidal marshes on the West Coast, and is also the second largest estuary in the entire US. So still a really important place. Um, the base tidal marshes are extremely productive habitats. So they produce a lot of nutrients and organic material that support the base food web. Um, the marsh plants themselves provide um, protected areas for many animals for foraging, breeding, and nesting, including a number of endangered species. It's, uh, the bay is important wintering habitat for waterfowl and shorebirds. And as we probably all know, it's also a really important stopover area for more than a million birds each year who migrate along the Pacific Flyway. So thinking about all that habitat loss, of course, the critters that lived in that habitat were also affected. And um, we have a number of threatened and endangered species in San Francisco Bay Estuary. And these are just a couple of examples that um, we um, work with on our project. Uh, salt marsh harvest mouse, California Ridgeways rail, and California black rail. 
So what are some of the threats to San Francisco Bay salt marshes currently? And the, the big one, like everybody else, is climate change. Um, we, uh, and the main one for salt marshes is sea level rise. Uh, much like you know, our coastal communities are um, going to be impacted by sea level rise with rising sea levels, the salt marshes that are at the edges of our communities are also going to be affected by um, increases in water level. Um, you know, with the higher water levels, that means more frequent inundation of the vegetation, which may lead to drowning of the marshes if they can't keep pace with sea level rise. In addition, we know about that climate change is causing shifting uh, precipitation patterns. So we're going to have less snowpack in the winter, probably have a rain, heavy, heavier rainfall, which is likely to have repercussions on our, our tidal marsh ecosystem. Also predicting more frequent and intense storms, which could lead to more erosion. Um, as on our coastal communities as well as our marshes. Uh, how do salt marshes, how can they help benefit our coastal communities? Well, they help mitigate the waves that we might be getting from these more frequent and intense storms. They can also help protect urban areas from flooding. And as I talked about before, we have water quality um, benefits that the marshes can help filter pollutants from our urban runoff. Um, they can help reduce erosion on communities that are adjacent to them, stabilize shoreline areas, um, sequester carbon um, to help with greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the things that we've discovered in this last year and a half is that uh, for our mental health, being out in the outdoors and open space has been, become really important to us. And so the San Francisco Bay Trail and the marshes around our bay have been really beneficial for us in terms of recreation. So this slide um, is just giving you a tiny little glimpse into conservation in San Francisco Bay and the little pieces that are relevant to the establishment of the Invasive Spartina project. Um, over in the left-hand corner, so we, you know, we talked about uh, we've lost 85% of our wetlands and we were gonna lose some more if Mr. Reber had had any say in the matter. Um, in the 1940s, you can see the diagram on the left he proposed uh, building basically two dams that would have been roughly where the Bay Bridge and the uh, Richmond San Rafael Bridge are now. And upstream of those dams would have been giant freshwater lakes. And as well, another part of the plan was to fill about 20,000 additional acres of the Bay along the East Bay shoreline with a shipping channel down the middle and a lock leading out into San Francisco Bay. And uh, luckily, by the 1960s, the Army Corps basically declared this plan infeasible and it went away. But in the meantime, um, this plan and other plans to fill the bay sort of catalyzed uh, uh, the bay conservation movements to start. So um, three women who were in the East Bay uh, looked at this plan and other things that were going on and said, you know, looked out their windows and said, they're gonna fill the bay in front of my window. And, and they started Save the Bay and kind of turned the vision of the bay from being a dumping ground into being the treasured open space and habitat for critters that we see it as today. Um, in addition, they helped catalyze the first wetland protection legislation um, geared towards San Francisco Bay that established the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, um, which is the first coastal zone management agency, state agency in the country that was targeted specifically or set up specifically for wetland protection and even more specifically to try to prevent future bay fill. And so as the community in the bay started to think about you know changing their the way they saw the wetlands and people started thinking about well we need we want to turn this around and and uh, stop seeing us lose more wetlands and start gaining more wetlands again. And so the first wetland restoration projects were proposed and came online in the 70s and the 80s. And as, as that was happening um, and coastal resources were becoming something to preserve, the Coastal Conservancy, which is a state agency, was established um, to basically promote and protect coastal resources and projects that promote the resources. While all this was happening um, in the 1980s, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, as part of a restoration project, introduced the East Coast Native cordgrass called Spartana or Alterniflora as part of a restoration project in the South Bay and San Francisco Bay. 
And we won't be talking too much about the East Coast species because what happened was a hybrid between the native and the East Coast species um, that then spread away from the original introduction site into other parts of the South Bay. And so individual landowners started trying to deal with this and uh, it quickly became clear that because it is a plant that can spread via rhizome on tidal waters that there was no way that one land landowner or land manager could deal with it and that there needed to be a coordinated concerted regional effort to combat this plant. And that's how the San Francisco Estuary and Basis Bartana project was established. So who are we and how do we do this work? So the ISP partners are the State Coastal Conservancy, which as I described before is a state of California agency that's was established to protect coastal resources. And they are co-leads with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which is a federal government agency that's um, tasked with protecting all of our fish, wildlife and plant species and their habitats. And they oversee the Endangered Species Act. Um, so they're co-leads on our project. And then the other two main partners are OEI. We're a small woman owned environmental consulting firm. We do the work on the ground and then Calypsi, which is the California Invasive Plant Council. And I think probably most of you are familiar with Calypsi, um, but if you're not, they're a statewide uh, nonprofit that basically has resources for land managers and other folks who are trying to deal with wildland weeds. Um, and their website has many useful resources if anybody wants to check it out. There's an invasive plant inventory for the entire state as well as species ID cards for invasive species. Um, they have a best, manage, best management practices manuals and also an archive from their annual symposia that they have every year. And um, shout out to their symposium that's happening this year. It's all online and it's from October 26th to 29th. So there's a little shout out for that. So um, those are our partners who are working on the project. In addition to these four main organizations, we have over 200 other partners around the Bay. If you imagine Bay Waters and the Bay Edge, any landowner or jurisdiction that has, an agency that has jurisdiction over something that touches the Bay, they're our partner because Invasive Spartina might grow there. So it's cities, counties, private landowners, um, local state and federal agencies, water districts, mosquito abatement districts, the list goes on and on. Okay, so before I talk about Invasive Spartina, I really wanted to talk about the native Pacific cordgrass, Spartina foliosa, also known as Sporabilis foliosus. It's a, the new name, a fairly new name based on a recent taxonomic revision. Um, I don't know that any of us in the Bay community are gonna be moving to that name anytime soon because we're also used to saying Spartina foliosa, but it's such a great name to say, so I had to say it. Um, Spartina foliosa is a perennial grass in the Poaceae family. It's rhizonymous. Um, the distribution is limited to California and Baja California. It's a foundational species in our low marshes in San Francisco Bay. That's an early colonizer. Um, and it grows in a really narrow elevational range. And so I included in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide, you see a marsh zonation diagram um, that kind of shows the, what, what the marsh looks like in San Francisco Bay. And you can see under the little orange arrow that I have in there, that's where Spartina foliosa grows. It grows in the low marsh. So it grows in that really narrow elevational range. We say it kind of stays in its lane. It, it's very nice. And um, so it doesn't grow down into the mud flats. It doesn't grow really up in the marsh plain or up into the, the ecotone. Uh, it's the only low marsh species that grows in higher salinities. And so in San Francisco Bay, in the South Bay and the Central Bay, 100% of the habitat that's out there for wildlife at low marsh elevations is the native cordgrass in a native marsh. Um, I also wanted to say that in San Francisco Bay, over 99% of the cordgrass that we have right now is the native Pacific cordgrass. So who are, what are the invasive species that we're talking about? Um, I'm gonna start with the one in the upper right-hand corner, Spartina densiflora, also known as Chilean cordgrass. That was introduced into California via, into Humboldt Bay actually, via um, timber trade ship ballast, and then introduced, introduced locally here in uh, San Francisco Bay 
uh, via a restoration project in the Cordomdera Creek watershed in Marin County. Um, as part of a restoration project, they misidentified it as a form of Spartina foliosa. Uh, the, it's also the only bunch grass, the perennial bunch grass of the species that we have here. Um, the plant in the left hand bottom corner, Spartina anglica, is was also introduced to San Francisco Bay as part of that same restoration project um, in Corte Madera Creek watershed. And Spartina anglica as actually a hybrid between uh, the East Coast native Spartina alterniflora and an English species uh, called Spartina maritima, hence the common name English cord grass. And then in the lower right hand corner, we have Spartina patens, which is salt meadow cord grass. I always have a hard time remembering that one, the common name for that one. And that's only found in one marsh in Benicia State Recreation Area. And the thing that I wanna say about these three species so far is that they are down to very, very small amounts in San Francisco Bay. They're almost eradicated. And the main uh, problem that we're still working on is hybrid Spartina, which is the photo in the middle. Um, and that is a hybrid between our West Coast native Pacific cord grass and the East Coast native Spartina alterniflora. And it is a uh, perennial rhizonymous grass. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what happened, how we ended up with a hybrid. Um, the East Coast species Spartina alterniflora was introduced here in the 1970s by the Army Corps of Engineers and Restoration Project. Um, it was a uh, a project where they were experimenting with ways to do bank stabilization of dredge spoils. Um, and it the, the East Coast native then ended up hybridizing with our native cord grass that was just adjacent to it in the same channel. And um, that kind of happened in the 70s and the early 80s without anybody noticing some hybridization event happened in there and then back crossing started happening over multiple generations and uh, basically that produced what's called a, a hybrid swarm which means there's a bunch of different morphologies and different forms of hybrid there isn't just one hybrid form um, but a bunch of different ones which means that because there's so many different forms that the the hybrid can actually exploit more tidal niche or more niches in the available habitat than the native cord grass could have or does. Um, so here's a little bit more on native cord grass um, and the hybrid. Now I'm going to talk about the hybrid. So you can see in the photograph, the plant on the left is Spartina foliosa and the plant on the right is hybrid Spartina. So something that happens with hybrids is hybrid vigor, um, which means that the hybrid itself tends to have more robust characters than either parent species. And in the case of, of hybrid Spartina, it tends to be taller, um, as you can see in the photo, it also tends to grow more densely, which means that it can outcompete all the other native tidal marsh plant species that are places where it colonizes. It also has longer inflorescences, as you can see in this photo, which means that it can produce more seed. Um, it also can do pollen swamping of, if it comes up adjacent to native cord grass, it can actually swamp the pollen of the native cord grass and then the native cord grass will produce hybrid seed. Um, the biggest problem for us though, is that this hybrid grows in a greater tidal range. So I've included the two marsh zonation diagrams again in this slide. On the left-hand side, you see the narrow range that native cord grass grows in. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you can see where hybrid Spartina is able to grow. So hybrid Spartina will grow much further down in the tidal frame and into mud flats. It can um, grow across the marsh plain, across pans, the salt pans that you find in the mid marsh plain, into channels, and then also it can even grow up into the ecotone, that transitional habitat between tidal marsh habitat and up into the uplands. Um, so therefore it, it kind of threatens all of those habitat types in the tidal marsh zone. Why is hybrid Spartina a problem? I kind of alluded to that a little bit in the last slide. It degrades the native tidal marsh ecosystem. As you can see in the picture at the top right, um, hybrid start because it grows, grows taller and grows more densely. Um, as you can see, it's become a monoculture in this picture. Um, and it's, if it were not checked, as it's showing in this picture, it can start to grow across the tidal marsh channels 
And so it's actually changing the hydrology in the marsh, um, causing all sorts of issues with tidal flows and it becomes a monoculture. Because it marches out across mudflats or lo in lower elevation than the native cordgrass, um, it actually comes to dominate mudflats that are adjacent to tidal marshes and um, can preclude uh, you know, foraging habitat for shorebirds. So that was impacting the, the, the shorebird community. And also UC Davis researchers did a lot of research on hybrid Spartina meadows um, and it, they found that it really changes the invertebrate community in a meadow versus the mudflat. So, you know, food availability for those shorebirds. Um, in a hybrid Spartina meadow, there's about 70% less invertebrates, um, biomass of invertebrates. And also the types of invertebrates that are present are different. If you can imagine all of that root mass being there, it kind of excludes the invertebrates and you don't have the surface feeding uh, invertebrates that were there before, they become subsurface feeders. And so if you imagine a shorebird and how far their bill goes into the top of the mud, they can't reach anything beyond surface feeders. And so it, it can impact the food resources for shorebirds as well, as well as just physical space. You know, a shorebird trying to um, actually forage in a dense Spartina meadow is difficult. Uh, hybrid Spartina also endangers native Pacific hard grass because it can outcompete the native cordgrass, and if left unchecked, hybrid Spartina would likely result in the extinction of, cordgrass, of Pacific cordgrass. Um, I alluded to this a little early. It also reduces flight control capacity because it can grow out into the tidal, goes across tidal marsh channels, which would block flood flows, um, so causing potentially causing flooding upstream. Um, uh, mosquito abatement districts around San Francisco Bay are also some of our best partners because they found that hybrid Spartina meadows actually result in ponding of water. And when you have ponded water, you know, you get more mosquitoes. And if you have more mosquitoes, you have a risk of disease like West Nile virus. Um, so for all of these reasons, um, uh, hybrid Spartina causes failed native tidal marsh restoration because if you have hybrid Spartina present nearby, then when you open up a new restoration marsh, the first plant you're gonna get is hybrid Spartina. It's gonna come in, colonize, take over, become a monoculture, and you never get to that place you want to get with a native tidal marsh where you have you know nice sinuous channels and you have marsh plain with pickleweed and you have salt pans and then you have some higher elevation stuff. Basically hybrid spartina threatens all of those habitat types. So this slide shows you um, how hybrid spartina is an ecosystem engineer. Um, you can see in the top gray or black and white photo that in the red triangle you can see some the beginnings of a few hybrid Spartina clones just starting to grow offshore of this creek. And then by 2004 below, you can see how much the hybrid Spartina has accreted sediment and then kind of marched out into the mudflats. And you can see even in the top part of the photograph, there's that clone that's way offshore. And you can sort of imagine if left unchecked, the hybrid Spartina would eventually have taken over all of the mudflats adjacent to our shorelines. So in response to the threat, this threat to the estuary, the Invasive Spartina project was initiated to coordinate estuary-wide Spartina control efforts. And uh, the project began full-scale implementa implementation in 2005. And we do annual surveys of over 70,000 acres to help inform our treatment program of where potential hybrid Spartina is. And this slide just sort of gives you an idea of the extent of where we look every year. Um, although we don't actually survey everything every year, um, but we do survey a lot of it. Um, this slide shows from basically 2005 to 2020, and the green is showing you places where there's no hybrid Spartina, and the red is showing you places where there's over an acre of hybrid Spartina, and you can see over time um, the successful treatment that we've had to get rid of hybrid Spartina in San Francisco Bay. Um, you can see the red goes away as you move to the right and 2020 is represented in, in the larger map. We're not, we haven't gotten rid of all of our red sites, but it's, we've had significant success in knocking back this plant. And this is another way of representing that graphically. We started with roughly 805 net acres in 2005 and we're down to 33 acres in 2020. Um, that's roughly a 
uh, reduction in high risk for tie estuary wide. And we're at that point where it's critical to just continue with our projects so that we can complete eradication in support of all the regional native tidal marsh restorations that have already come online and are anticipated in the future. Um, and now I'm gonna turn this over to Lindsay who's gonna talk to you about how we managed to do this. Great, thank you, Jeannie. Uh, I'm, yes, I'm Lindsay. Hi, everybody. Um, and so Jeannie just spent the last 20 minutes um, explaining why what we do uh, is important and necessary. And I'm going to spend the next 20, 25 minutes talking about how we do this important work. So um, I'll be introducing you to uh, the Invasive Spartina Project's various programs. And those include our inventory and our treatment programs. So we go out and we inventory um, hybrid Spartina, and then we go back out and we treat the patches that we find. Um, and then we also have our Ridgeways Rail program where we monitor the population of Ridgeways Rails throughout the San Francisco estuary. And then we have our revegetation program, which um, you heard earlier, Jeannie is our manager for our reveg program. So that involves going back and adding plants in areas where we've removed hybrid Spartina, as well as bolstering marsh habitat for rails throughout the bay, um, even in marshes that we're not actively removing a lot of hybrid. Um, so I think this picture is really great. It was taken from a helicopter because we do a little bit of aerial surveying and treatment um, by our Drew Kerr, who's our treatment, one of our treatment managers. and. Um, you can see, if you look closely, there are two biologists down there in that marsh. Um, and I think this is a great representation of how you can find some incredible wild lands just off the coast of some, you know, right next to some very busy urban areas. So Jeannie and I and the rest of our coworkers go out into these marshes and we take some airboat rides or whaler boat rides to get out there. And um, you come from San Francisco or Redwood City and these really populated areas and suddenly you feel like you're absolutely in the middle of nowhere. So this gives that some good context. You can see that those guys down there um, don't feel urban at all. Next slide, Jeannie. So uh, as Jeannie mentioned, OEI biologists inventory up to 70,000 acres of San Francisco Bay um, year to year in order to inform the invas invasive Spartina treatment. So this is our inventory program. And we walk around the marshes with handheld GPS units that help us take very accurate locations of hybrid Spartina patches. Um, and the benefits of this extensive inventory and mapping, basically going to marshes multiple times a year to map and then coming back to treat, um, it saves time. We don't have to take treatment crews wandering around the marshes to find hybrid Spartina. It's already been found and mapped and they can go directly to it and plan their days really strategically to get out there and take care of it. Um, also very importantly, it reduces the impacts to this very sensitive habitat that we're marching around in. So we're trying to keep as little impact as we can and as few boots on the ground in any given area. Um, so that way we can lead treatment crews to these mapped features and that minimize walking, minimizes walking through the marsh and disturbing any sensitive habitat more than we really need to. Um, it also allows us more time to thoroughly inventory the marsh and identify the hybrid Spartina um, because we want to save as much of the native foliosa as we possibly can. But this is not an easy task. Um, Jeannie sort of alluded to hybrid Spartina doesn't look like any particular thing. Depends on where you are, um, especially like location around the bay as well as marsh conditions down lower, closer to the water. Plants can look much different than up higher near upland plants. So we're looking at very different morphs of um, hybrid Spartina depending on where we are in any given part of the bay. Um, so we help to inform these decisions when they get really tough with some genetic testing. We actually do some pretty extensive genetic testing. We take approximately 500 genetic samples um, every year to help identify hybrids before treatment so we can preserve as much native foliosa as we can. And I'm going to talk about our DNA sampling program a little bit more in a moment. Next slide, Jeannie. So you've already seen this graphic in Jeannie's slide, but I just wanted to emphasize um, both the monitoring extent, uh, how much 
space and ground we cover um, year to year, as well as the widespread green and yellow sub areas, which is fantastic. We're looking at some really great improvements from those earlier maps that Jeannie showed you where the whole bottom of the bay is red. Um, so we have 220 sub areas. We've divided up the bay into all these chunks to help us manage it. And that represents those 70,000 acres of habitat. And in 2020, OEI went out and we mapped 33 net acres of invasive Spartina. So for context, 33 acres out of 70,000 acres is 0.0005% of those 70,000 acres had invasive Spartina. So as Jeannie pointed out, the dark green is no invasive Spartina, the light green is less than 10 meters squared of invasive Spartina. And then if Jeannie can click the slide, a star should appear, yep, there. And just adjacent to the star, left of it, you'll see a little finger kind of coming out like this. Um, that is AFCC, the Alameda Flood Control Panel, and that is actually the original introduction site of Invasive Spartina. And what's super cool is that that little finger is green, which means that um, we've done a really great job eradicating Invasive Spartina there. And I'm actually going to talk about some restoration that we've done there too, taking these big hybrid bands, remove, you know, getting rid of them, and then bringing back and planting native foley. And now we have these beautiful foley bands growing along that channel. So it's really cool to see. I've only been at the project for five years. So people who have been here longer than me have seen this happening in real time. Um, but we take great photos to kind of represent each year to year. We go on and take the same photo over and over again so we can really see the progress and you'll get to see some of those. So as you can tell, this is a huge inventory effort. Um, we survey most of these sub areas every year and we get eyes on every acre at least every couple years, even if we're not getting boots on the ground, we're going out with boats, um, we're bringing out binoculars, we are getting our eyes on these parts of these marshes as much as we can. Next slide. So just diving quickly a little deeper into the numbers that we just talked about. So 151 of those 220 sub areas now contain less than 10 meters squared of invasive Spartina. So just 186 meters squared or about 0.05 acres of hybrid Spartina are left in those 151 sub areas. So the majority of the hybrid Spartina we have left to take care of occurs in what is that? 220 minus 151. So 70, 70, <laughs> 70 acres. Um, and we use square meters in the field to take our best approximation of the amount of hybrid Spartina as we map it. So we go out at the beginning of the season. I was actually out. We hire seasonals every summer to help us with our treatment program. And I was out with them today. And we do lots of calibration every year so that we're really on the same page about how to map stuff and really get a good representation year to year of what we're seeing um, and talk to them today about we literally held me measuring sticks up to our bodies and looked at what a meter looks like on our bodies. Mine is my fingertips to my shoulder. Um, so we can really get in there and, and approximate what we're seeing and, and do a decent job of, of, of getting an idea of what's, what's out there um, year to year. Next slide, Jeannie. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our genetic sampling. So OEI biologists use, biologists use genetic sampling technology to help inform our Spartina ID. And we do this when the field ID is uncertain. So that can be early in the season, um, or it can be when we have sort of lower confidence hybrid patches. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a second, but really it just means that our hybrid looks so different depending on where you are um, that we sometimes have a hard time identifying it and we need some help. Um, and then we have sort of a sure thing baseline for comparison so we can confirm Spartina foliosa for use in restoration too. So we want to make sure that if we're pulling Spartina and using its seeds um, and growing plants to plant in other sites, we want to be extra sure that we're not grabbing Spartina that's hybridized or has any hybrid to its DNA. So that's super important. Next slide. So I'm walking around the marsh, which I, you know, this is my whole summer, really. I spend walking, or Jeannie too, lots of us uh, are walking around the marshes and looking for hybrid Spartina. And I come across this patch and it's kind of bright green and it's a little spiky. And I think it might look kind of different than everything 
around it, but I'm not really sure. And maybe this is a site where we're really trying to preserve as much fully as we can. So maybe I wanna take a genetic sample of this this year. Next slide. So how can I determine if this is invasive spartina by doing genetic sampling? So we can attempt to identify first by morphology, um, looking at the location, the site history. We have very extensive site info for the sites that we go to um, that tell us what hybrid has looked like in the previous years. But if that's too challenging in this case, I've decided that it is, I wanna take a sample. Um, we enlist these genetic tools to help identification. So we use uh, microsatellite sequences, which are repetitive DNA sequences, usually several base pairs in length. And microsatellite sequences are composed of non-coding DNA and are not part of um, the plant's genes or genome. They're used as genetic markers to follow the inheritance of genes and families. So they basically tell us, does this plant have hybrid gene, have um, genes that are indicative that it's a hybrid plant. So we have genome advisors in LA that use 15 microsatellites to perform PCR analysis. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And this is the same basic method we used, um, that's not we used, but had that is used for COVID testing, which is interesting. So um, it amplifies the sequences of DNA markers and the markers that we use were actually developed by UC Davis. Next slide. So we combine all 15 markers into a statistical analysis program structure that gives us an estimate of the ancestry of this individual plant. Um, so when I'm out there taking a sample, I'll take some measurements and then I'll actually take a leaf from this plant um, and we'll send it in for analysis. And this is the data that some of the data that comes back from that. So this graph shows the analysis of several thousand um, foliosa and hybrid spartina plants. And that distinct spike you see on the left uh, for Spurtina foliosa in green shows that there is a much more distinct signature for foliosa. So um, it's much more concentrated. Whereas for hybrid Spartina, the graph shows that there's a much broader range of genetic, genetic diversity, um, which makes sense because we know we have hybrid swarm and we also see a variety of morphologies in the field, which I mentioned before. Um, and hybrid swarm is a continuous series of morphologically distinct hybrids resulting from the hybridization of two species that is then followed by crossing and back crossing of sub subsequent generations. So um, as an analogy to compare foliosa and the genetic um, makeup of foliosa and uh, hybrid spartina, um, Foliosa is sort of the Labrador retriever, the like purebred to the mutt hybrid. So the hybrid has a lot more gene variation going on in there. And then um, that overlapping region, you'll see kind of is in a darker red down there where like the bumps of the foli kind of peter out and the hybrid Spartina bumps up. Um, that's sort of where we get less certain because our goal is to eradicate our threshold for what to treat. Um, and it's pretty far to the left of this graph. So we tend to treat most of what lands in this overlapping region just to kind of be safe. Um, so everything to the right of zero will likely treat even though that might be foliosa, but we um, wanna make sure that we're really getting rid of hybrid Spartina. And we actually have a DNA specialist on staff. His name is Brian Ort. Um, and all of this information comes from Brian. I'm very hopeful that I represented it well. Um, and Jeannie and I will definitely try to answer your questions about it. But if you have any like really thorough, deep questions about genetic testing, we're going to definitely point you toward Brian. <laughs> Next slide, Jeannie. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about treatment. So we've gone out and we've identified these plants and now we're gonna go back out and treat them. Um, and we use different tools in our toolbox depending on, um, first of all, what species of hybrids, for, or, um, what species of invasive Spartina we're treating. So Jeannie introduced several species of invasive Spartina, not just hybrid Spartina. Um, and we do use, for like Spartina densiflora, which was the big bushy one that Jeannie talked about first. Um, we actually dig that one. It's one of the invasive Spartina species um, that occurs mostly up in Marin. Um, and it's a bunch grass, so it, digging is the most effective for dense, densiflora, we call it dense. 
And then we've also used tarps in small areas on several invasives for tinus species um, where herbicide isn't permitted or where we dug a plant multiple years in a row and it keeps coming back. We have a couple examples of plants that just won't quit. So we go out and we tarp them and we literally cut out all their light and then we can finally get rid of them that way. Um, and generally rhizominous plants are difficult to dig effectively because if you miss rhizome fragment, fragments, the plant can regrow. So um, that's why we use a mazapir, um, an herbicide to treat hybrid Spartina. Next slide. So I'll just briefly talk about uh, Spartina densiflora, but I'm mostly gonna talk about um, hybrid Spartina. So we, like I said, we dig Densi. Um, and in historical Densiflora sites, they're mostly located up in Marin, as I mentioned, and we go up there twice annually, once in the spring, usually like, I guess not really spring, kind of late winter, um, like January, and then we come back in June when the plants are flowering. And the reason we go twice is because in the spring, I'm um, sorry, in the winter in January. Uh, the plants are really bright green compared to all the kind of senesced um, brown pickleweed around them. So they're much easier to spot. Um, but then later in the year in June, they have flowered, which makes them even easier to find. But the trick is that once they have flowered, they're setting out seed and the seed bank for density is five years. So we really want to try to catch it earlier in the year before it goes to seed because um, that'll set us back decently um, if we miss a plant. So um, we used to have just tons of Densiflora uh, way before I started at OEI um, up in Marin. And there are sites where I think it was being like carted away in wheelbarrows. There was so much of it. And now we have very, very little left. I think in 2020, we had 66 seedlings total. And this one in the picture is actually pretty big compared to what we find. Um, we're usually finding plants that are little and just a couple stems and it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, and some of our staff are really, really good at it, um, which is great. So yeah, it was 5.2 meters squared was found and removed in 2020. So we've actually reduced Densiflora by 99%, 99.9% 9 from its original peak. Um, and finding these tiny seedlings is really challenging. So um, that's why we go out twice a year and we really take our time looking for this plant. Next slide, Jeannie. So I'm going to talk a little bit about amazapir, which is the herbicide that we use to remove hybrid Spartina in most areas of San Francisco Bay. Um, so the EPA considers amazapir practically non-toxic and concentrations in the water after treatment are much lower than any amount that would be of concern for wildlife. So there's actually a 90% reduction detected within the first week um, after the amazapir is applied and it has a really low potential to bioaccumulate. So it specifically targets the plant that it's sprayed on. Um, it has to be sprayed with at least four hours of dry time, which means we need to go out when the tide is dropping or at least as low as it's gonna get and it's not going um, the plants aren't gonna get washed with, within four hours of spraying them because once the chemical is diluted by water, it's practically useless. Um, and amazapir works by targeting plant amino acids specifically. So um, it targets three plant amino acids that animals do not have, which makes it really great to use in systems like this, where we really don't want to impact the wildlife um, any more than we need to. Um, and then treatment takes place with close monitoring by biologists. So we have um, contractors that we work with um, and we go out and they help us, they bring their airboats, they help us carry the chemical, they actually um, apply the chemical for us and a biologist is with them all the time to make sure that there aren't any sensitive species in the area, that these contractors aren't applying chemical anywhere else other than where, the, where they're supposed to. Um, and we're really careful about making sure that we don't spray a mazapir on the plants that we're trying to protect. So especially like Grindelia stricta or marsh gum plant. Um, that's a great rail habitat plant, and we actually go out and plant that when we do our reveg program. Um, and so we are very active about making sure we're not getting um, any amazapir on gum plant. Pickleweed is a little bit more resilient. Um, 
if it gets sprayed during these treatment surveys, it often comes right back the next year um, and moves really quickly across the open mud to fill in spaces that have been left empty by, um, by spraying out these patches of hybrid Spartina. Next slide. So the Invasive Spartina project is an example of a conservation dilemma. And that's because um, we are getting rid of a plant that an endangered species actually kind of likes. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Ridgeways rail, um, but it's sort of an endangered species versus invasive species conundrum. So basically human development has led to this massive loss of tidal wetlands in the San Francisco Bay and the wildlife are dependent on these wetlands um, have become, you know, some of them have become endangered species because there's not as much wetland available to them as habitat. So human action led to this introduction of highly invasive species, which do help to create more habitat. So how do we balance removing these invasive species while protecting the endangered species? Well, the answer is adaptive management. So we treat, we restore, we survey to assess populations, and then we re-consultate and go on with further treatment. So we're always kind of checking and balancing and making sure that the work we're doing um, isn't having a negative impact on the species that we care about. And that leads me into the next slide where I'm gonna talk about our endangered Ridgeways rail. So hybrid Spartina, benefit to Ridgeways rails. Um, it basically created novel habitat where there was none and provides great cover at high tide. So Jeannie showed you some great examples of marshes that have grown out because hybrid Spartina can grow farther out into the mud flat than our native Spartina can. Um, and uh, basically this created this band of new marsh where there wasn't any before. Um, and it grew tall to provide this great cover at high tide. And it also outcompetes native Spartina and other vegetation. Um, so removing this invasive Spartina creates this temporary deficit in ecosystem function, um, the function that had been temporarily, temporarily provided by the hybrid. Uh, but it usually is provided by these native plants. So how do we get in there and get native plants back in um, to make sure that this habitat isn't depleted? Next slide. So I'll quickly say like how we keep track of the rail populations throughout the bay. So we know if our restoration efforts are impacting the, uh, these species. Um, we, along with uh, Point Blue and uh, I think several other uh, companies conduct call, ca call count surveys between the months of January and April. So that's what keeps us busy that time of year. Um, and that's the start of breeding season. So our rails are active and vocal and they're looking for their mate and um, they're a secret of marsh birds, so we don't see them very much. Uh, we see them more than other people probably would because we're out in their habitat. Um, but even when we do see one, we're backing away and giving it its space and making sure we don't, don't bum it out too much. So um, we do these call count surveys by listening for them. So we have data collection points that are usually located. You can see Jeannie down there on the bottom um, walking along a levee. And our points are located about 200 meters apart. And then we stand at each of these points for 10 minutes. And at minute six and seven, we broadcast to see if the birds will call back to us. And we listen for Ridgeways rails and black rails specifically. And then these survey results just represent a subset of the population at any given site because not all birds will call. I think the data has shown that there's about a 60% detection uh, probability. I think that was a USGS study. And then biologists then record the distance and location of the call. And then we go back and we map out the birds um, to make sure we don't have any repeats because you can't hear the same bird from two stations if it's kind of right in the middle. Um, yeah, and then we get an idea of, of how many birds are out in the marshes that we're working in. Next slide. <laughs> uh oh, we might be stuck again. There we go. Awesome. Okay, so despite the fact that we're removing habitat um, by treating invasive Spartina, um, but we're also adding it back again through our restoration program. Uh, our rail call counts over the past 10 years have gone up, as you can see in this figure. 
Um, this data was collected by ISP and other partner organizations, including US Fish and Wildlife Service and Point Blue. And this is due in part to the successful revegetation program, of course, um, that helps to mitigate the impacts of removing invasive Spartina. But it's also just because there's been a huge effort baywide to restore uh, native marshland. So there are multiple factors going into why these numbers are going up, but the main point is they're going up and that's really exciting and great to see. So, next slide. So there he is, or she is, the star of the show, the Endangered Ridgeways Rail. Um, and it's really at the center of our, our restoration program. So one of our main challenges is balancing this hybrid Spartina removal with the need to protect habitat for these Ridgeways Rails. And that's what our restoration program grew out of was that challenge. So our main goal is to rapidly in all capital letters in my notes, I bet that's from Jeannie, enhance tidal marsh habitat to benefit Ridge Rays Rails primarily, but also tidal marsh dependent wildlife in general. Um, and the focus of our program has been enhancements at ISP treatment sites specifically. Next slide. So ISP's revegetation program was started in 2011 and we just completed our 10th year of habitat enhancements. Um, this program is guided by our plan, which is informed by our tech advisory committee and implemented at a baywide scale. The program focuses on critical components of rail habitat, so cover from predators for foraging, as well as roosting, nesting, and high tide refuge. And we actively use adaptive management to learn from enhancement efforts and inform future efforts. So for example, in the first year of the program, we lost most of our native cordgrass plantings at one site due to grazing by Canada geese. So we experimented with some rope caging and now at new sites, we initially use rope caging to protect at least half of the native cordgrass plantings until we can get a good assessment of the likelihood of um, grazing at any particular site. Next slide. So this map here shows the 40 plus sites where we have implemented, implemented habitat enhancements throughout San Francisco Bay. So the blue areas on the map show plantings, primarily um, planted Spartina foliosa and then marsh gum plant, Grindelia stricta. Um, and the orange shows where we have installed uh, high tide refuge island features. Um, so we've done 72 at 16 sites throughout the bay. Um, and I think we did like 10 plus of those this year. So it's a big effort going out and moving some mud around and making these islands that become this high tide refuge um, for rails, et cetera. And that photo down there at the bottom shows ISP staff and contractors planting gum plant along a channel to provide refuge for rails. So you can see kind of right along the bottom of that channel, um, down at the bottom of the photo, those are some fresh, green, beautiful baby gum plants. And then we go out and we monitor these. So actually that pole there on the left-hand side of the photo, this is a photo point. So a biologist is standing at a specific location. That pole is at a specific place in the photo. And that makes it so we can repeat these photos year to year and see how these planting sites are doing. Um, and we use the data we gather from that to know where we should be planting gum plant or foliosa um, in the future because it is a big effort. Um, so we want to make sure that we're putting plants in places where they're going to have the best chance at not only surviving, but also functioning as we hope they will, which is by providing great habitat. Next slide. So I mentioned the critical components of rail habitat, which is coverage for foraging, roosting, nesting, and high tide refuge. Um, so in most tidal marshes of SF Bay, this vertical cover is provided by a pretty small suite of plant species, which is primarily Spartina foliosa at these lower elevations and Grindelia stricta up along the banks of tidal channels and in mid and high marsh at those higher elevations. And our program focuses on active planting of specifically those two species. So this slide shows examples of four sites where we've done plantings. On the left, you'll see Pacific cordgrass Spartina foliosa at Eden Landing. Um, 
So up on the upper left of the slide, that's Eden Landing. That's an early restoration project. So it's mud flat before the planting there in the, in the far, upper left hand corner. Um, and this is at AFCC, that channel that I talked about earlier, which was our, in, our initial introduction site of hybrid Spartina. Um, so you can see that the hybrid's been removed in this case, or maybe this was um, a naked mud flat in the first place. But either way, we went out and we planted Foley there. And a few years later, we had this beautiful Foley band um, in that 2017 photo uh, up just to the, to the right of that upper left photo. Um, and then on the right, upper right, you'll see two sites at Hayward Shoreline. So um, that upper right, those upper right photos are a channel in Hayward that didn't have any grindelia along it. And four years later, it has these beautiful big grindelia stricta. Um, and that channel that those plants are now concealing is what we sometimes affectionately call like a rail runway. So those guys are running up and down the channels, um, staying protected um, in those areas from any predators that might be nearby. And so those plants um, really make that great habitat for whales. And then same thing down at the bottom, that 2015 to 2020 pictures show um, basically uh, lots of pickleweed in the first one and lots of great grandelia in the second one. So creating really nice habitat for these endangered birds. Next slide. So here's a great example from the Eden Landing Ecological Reserve. So this photo shows um, Eden Landing, part of Eden Landing in 2011 with open unvegetated mudflat after um, the tide gates had been opened to start the restoration of tidal flow in this area. And this site is really far from any local source of native cordgrass, um, which would be the marsh plant we would expect to come in and colonize given these marsh plant elevations. So we wanted to jumpstart the trajectory of the site from open mudflat to potential habitat for Ridgeways Rail. Um, so we did active plantings of native cordgrass. Next slide. So this slide shows some of these native cordgrass plantings. Again, we have three photo points, A, B, and C, going from top to bottom. Um, and on the left of each, you can see uh, what the site looked like initially. And then on the right of each, you can see what it's looked like uh, back in 2018. And um, on the right side of the slide, you'll see kind of a great representation of what a biologist at OEI um, looks at on one of our GIS units or back in the office when we pull up our arc map. So we've got um, some, some uh, imagery in the background that shows what this area of the marsh looks like. You can get an idea of where some channels might be. Um, you can get a really good idea of where some good channels are by where we planted or where we've chosen to plant. So the orange that you see kind of up along the kind of upper left of that image. Um, the orange is along a channel, that's Grindelia, and then all of the green is Foliosa. And then you'll see in that same picture, A, B, and C, those photo points correspond to the photos on the left. So each of those is where a biologist goes and takes photos to document um, what these sites look like year to year. And then the little birds and circles are Ridgeway's rail points. So those correspond to those data points we're taking uh, between January and April when we go out and do our Ridgeway's rail surveys. So we use maps like this when we go out to plant Foliosa and Grindelia stricta in the places where um, someone has gone out, one of our biologists has gone out and done some ground truthing and uh, chosen places that we think these plants will be successful and also beneficial to uh, Ridgeways Rail. And then we go out with our contractors and lots of plants and we get them in the ground and see how they do. Next slide. So after all of that, here's what that site looks like now. So from mudflat to marsh and the river population at this site is responding rapidly and expanding. So we had no birds detected in 2018. We had eight birds in 2020 and this past year, 2021, we had 13 Ridgeways rail detected in this marsh. And then just to remind you, that's not all the Ridgeways rail that are in here. Studies show that that's about 60%. So we're doing really, really well 
um, getting some rails into this great new habitat. Next slide. So this is an example at AFCC, the flood channel that we keep coming back to, our original intro site. Um, of the, this is an example of the rapid spread of invasive Spartina. Um, and then we'll see some successful control and restoration with planting of um, foliosa in the next couple slides. So if you note the size and position of the clones circled in red and blue, and just their relationship to the rest of the hybrids on the shoreline, I'll have Jeannie click to the next slide. Keep your eyes on those circles. And that's those circles now. So the two red ones that were floating out by themselves have been engulfed into a monoculture of hybrid Spartina. And then that blue one is just about to be two. So this is what we were dealing with in 2005 when the project started. Um, and that blue circled one has grown considerably and is about to be assimilated into the shoreline and if left unchecked, it would just keep creeping out and out and that channel would slowly start to get much skinnier if we didn't do anything about it. So next slide. This is what AFCC looks like now after successful control and extensive replanting with native cordgrass. So plantings have expanded to reestablish the continuous narrow band. And I say narrow because it doesn't encroach down onto the mud and into the channel. It stays in its lane and uh, exists where we need it to, to um, create this great habitat and also be a respectful part of its ecosystem instead of one that just takes over like the ever moving amoeba blob that is hybrid. So these plantings have expanded to reestablish that band. Um, and this is what existed prior to that invasion um, of invasive Spartina. So it looks how it should. Next slide. So just to kind of wrap everything up, um, the Invasive Spartina project is, as I sort of alluded to before, a constantly moving target as we continue to remove invasive Spartina, restore native marsh habitat, and monitor our California Ridgeways rails and other species that we want to protect in our native marshes. And we hope that working toward this balance can help create and protect healthy native marshes that are more resilient in the face of sea level rise and climate change. Next slide. It's just Jeannie's issue having one last finale. <laughs> well, that's it, that's our last slide. Oh, okay. I thought there was the one with all the logos. I know, I don't know where it is. We're missing our, our thanks to the partner slide. It's not in here. Well, that's okay. Thanks to all of our partners. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for listening. And we'll take your questions now. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you for that um, really interesting walk through the marshes. Um, big question, why did they introduce the East Coast species rather than using the native species? You know, that I think that answer to that question is lost in the annals of time. I don't know exactly why they did. Maybe they were experimenting um, because they thought the East Coast species might do a better job of bank stabilization. Um, we don't know the answer to that question, unfortunately. I, one of our former colleagues actually did a bunch of digging in various archives around the Bay to try and find the reports on those projects, on the restoration projects and um, could never successfully really nail it down. Yeah, maybe it was the same person who thought that um, um, the South African um, fig would uh, stabilize sand dunes. Um, banks. So, um, so one question was, um, how long does genetic sampling and analysis take? In an ideal situation, it typically takes three to four weeks, I believe. I'm trying to remember, Lindsay, correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, you know, we collect the sample, we put it in our sub, our special refrigerator overnight or basically for about a week. And then our genetics, our geneticist puts together a package, sends it off to LA and to the lab and they process the PCR analysis in LA and then they ship it back up to us and then Brian 
um, runs it through program structure. And I believe the whole process ideally takes three to four weeks. And we really only run samples in the growing season. So um, we haven't even run any samples yet this year. Um, we start to do field work right about now. And so the samples, I think probably our first batch comes back sometime in July, sometime in late July. Actually this year, it must be August since we're already in the middle of July. Um, I hope, I don't know if this is um, too technical, but um, how often do you perform genetic identification on samples you are not suspicious of? to determine your false negative rate for hybrid Spartina detection? We, so, is Brian still on the call? He can Brian, probably. Brian. <laughs> we can call him. Our geneticist is actually on the call. Um, but we do, we do take um, uh, for sure samples on both ends. So uh, sample to basically inform structure. Um, we take samples of what we consider to be high, high confidence hybrid Spartina, just based on the physical features. And we also take samples of what we consider to be high, high confidence native foliage. So based on location and morphology, um, you know, distance from, if we, there's locations in the North Bay where we've never identified any hybrid Spartina ever in the course of our project. And it's, you know, at least a mile or two away from any invasive Spartina. And we feel very sure that those plants are native. So we do, both samples have been run, both ends of the spectrum have been run in program structure to inform it. Oh, Brian put into the chat, we do focus sampling to confirm S. foliosa and hybrid every few years. And um, maybe there's another genetic sampling question. Um, what does it mean when foliosa and hybrid markers overlap? What does that overlapping area mean? Is that just because they're closely related? I think that is what it means. And maybe we can give Brian a second to type an answer if he has something more succinct. But I think it is because foliosa is part of the genetic makeup of these hybrid plants. Like they, it was alterniflora and, and foliosa hybridizing in the first place. So, um, you know, basically it's like saying, if taking it back to the great dog analogy that Brian gave us, if you have a Labrador, you know, a purebred, lab and then you have a mutt that has a little bit of lab in it right it's a mix of lab and cocker spaniel and whatever it is you're going to have that little overlap of you know the lab parts of of that genetic makeup and i think that's probably a little bit of a dumbed down version of the answer maybe brian has something better but that's what i think the answer is <laughs> since like i'm on, hi this is brian um since i am unmuted now uh thank you to the host who did that um yeah i'll just say exactly what, what Lindsay said, um, there, we have hybrid Spartina back crossing with native foliosa. And every time it back crosses with foliosa, it be, it, its genome becomes a little bit more foliosa-like. And so it's, it's sort of creeping more towards the foliosa side of things. And we honestly, we set a, what could be considered a rather arbitrary cutoff point. Um, where we say, okay, anything that's less foliosa than you know 10% of its ancestry is not foliosa. Anything that's 10% or more something else, um, that's sort of our cutoff point for when we decide this has too much alterniflora ancestry in it and we, we'd better treat that. I hope that answers. Thank you. And uh, Jeannie did answer about how Imazapir can affect other plants. And um, yeah, pickleweed is very resilient. Marsh gum plant, not so much. Um, I guess if something that's salt, salt tolerant, I guess it's tolerant of lots of things possibly. Um, another question was, um, I know asked about, um, you know, right now you're doing, um, restoration with Spartina foliosa and Gundelia stricta. And you said that you were looking into um, restoring ecotones, which mean, does that mean farther up the um, bank? And what species are, what species are being looked at? Um, 
so yeah, so the ecotone is that transitional habitat. It's a little higher elevation, so it's above the high marsh plain, but it's also not quite up into the uplands, so that it's influenced. It gets some tidal influence um, periodically, not necessarily every day like the regular tidal marsh would get. Um, and so Save the Bay, if you're familiar with Save the Bay, which I talked about at the beginning of the talk, that is the zone that they focus in completely with their restoration program. They have, you know, they do public outreach and um, they bring in classes and they do a lot of uh, planting of the transition zone. And so we're kind of taking the cue from them and working at some sites that they can't get to because they're either difficult to get to or, you know, for other reasons why Save the Bay isn't working there, we're gonna be working at some of those sites starting this winter. And our plant palette, so it's focused, it's basically focused on the plants that they found to be successful. Um, and we may be expanding it next year. This year, we're just starting out with a small suite of species. And off the top of my head, do I remember what they are? Um, Marsh baccarus, uh, which is... Um, Coyote brush something. No, it's not actually. It's uh, Baccarus. Um, it's got a new name. It used to be Douglas Eye. Now it is something else. Baccarus Douglas Eye. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, we tried to focus on plants that have more vertical structure because we want to have that transition zone also provide um, some ver uh, cover for, for rails and other wildlife who end up getting pushed up onto these higher elevation areas during extreme high tides, like king tides or extreme winter tides. Um, they end up with no habitat down in the marsh, so the transition zone is important to them. Um, Elmus triticoides, creeping wild rye, is another one because it's a really nice cover crop once it gets going. Uh, those might be the only two I can think of right now. Okay, so um, these are two questions that are sort of related, like is, um, the, are the hybrids wind pollinated? So how much of a radius do you have to worry about cross pollination? And do you have to keep monitoring and treating forever to make sure the hybrids don't come back? Jeannie, I can definitely take the first part of that question because it actually came up today and I asked Toby about it because I wasn't sure the answer. Um, but basically what uh, the, so Spartina, um, mostly comes back each year. So it dies off every year. These plants die off the, everything above the soil, above the mud. Um, so when we come back in the winter, it's all brown and senesced. And then um, new plants come up in the late spring, early summer, and um, they come up out of the mud, out of the rhizomes, and they primarily come back each year that way. And the clones spread bigger and bigger by creeping out in the mud with their rhizomes. Um, and what Toby explained to me today, one of our, um, he's our, one of our managers, is that um, the seeds of Spartina hybrid and foliosa alike um, need, have very specific requirements for temperature and like salinity and water. And they have all these really specific requirements for those seeds to be successful. So we actually don't see a lot of patches moving via seed. Um, they usually creep along under the mud with their rhizomes. That being said, it definitely does happen. Um, so we have some sites that are next to, Jeannie doesn't really get into this much, but we have a couple no treatment sites located around the bay um, where hybrid has is really just like able to kind of thrive currently. Um, and the seeds from that drift down and we actually have to sort of manage um, sections of the bay next to those sites that get a lot of seed recruitment. So it depends on the site, um, but I would say generally we're looking at rhizome um, expansion via rhizome. Um, there was one more thing I was going to say about that. Anyway, I don't know if you want to say anything more about no treatment sites, but I think the no treatment sites sort of leads us into the answer to that next question, which is what is the future of Oops. this program and how are we going to ever be actually done? Maybe Jeannie can tackle that one. Well, I did. I wanted to uh, say that there was some research done by UC Davis on that very thing about the radius around the hybrids. Um, and it probably varies, but my memory of it, and I, it's been a long time since I read that paper, um, was that it's about 100 meters. That that if you were if you were worried about, I'm sure that you know, 
most of the pollen falls within a very close distance to the hybrid and the further you go out. But if you're, if you're working on or worried about how far out you need to go, then a hundred meters would cover it. Um, so, you, so you don't have to worry about cross pollination. That distance covers it. Um, and then the second part of the question was, do we have to keep monitoring and treating forever to make sure the hybrids don't come back? So at some point, once we have eradicated or controlled the hybrid Spartina that we find, we think that because once again, these hybrids are always going to have, the hybrids are part foliosa and part hybrid, that we will basically kill off all of the bad actors. Um, and if there is a low level of a few genetic markers out there that indicate that it might be a very small amount of hybrid ancestry in those remaining plants, as long as they don't become bad, bad actors, we should be able to finish the project. Um, that's our intent and that's what our hope is. Um, and we truly believe that we'll still be able to do that. Um, it really is that a lot, so a lot of the, when Lindsay talks about not being certain about identification, that usually is early in the season or the first year that that plant came up and it's not showing its full character. We find that, you know, year two, year three, when we come back, the plants generally show themselves at some point and we then we can get rid of it. Um, but, you know, at the very beginning, it's a grass and it's not growing necessarily poking up and showing itself within the matrix of the native cord grass. And that's our biggest, I mean, if we were, if we could exist in a world where the native cord grass didn't exist, then it would be really easy to get rid of hybrid, but we don't want to take out the native any more than we need to. And so we're having to be a little bit careful about where we treat the hybrid at some sites. And therefore we sometimes miss it for the first year or maybe even the second year, but we'll get it once it shows it shows itself, once it shows its true colors. Okay, and Brian is answering some of the really technical questions in the chat, thank you. And this is another one that maybe um, Brian has an answer to. Would, and I wondered about this too, would natives ever genetically overwhelm hybrid populations and dilute the non-native DNA component to an inconsequential amount? Um, yeah, Jeannie kind of touched on that just now. Um, uh, the, in terms of like, the, the, the hybrid plant is better at pollen swamping a native plant than the other way around. So, um, if a um, if we continue to reduce the amount of hybrid that's available in the in the habitat to spread its pollen, then yes, the hope is that um, eventually, even if there is an, a, a plant with some hybrid ancestry in it, the amount of hybrid ancestry that is still in that plant would be inconsequential. Um, and I think that's something that Jeannie was talking about just a moment ago while I was trying to type another answer in the chat. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't phrase it the same way that the person who asked the question um, said it in that I don't think that the native genome is going to overwhelm the hybrid genome, but more that um, eventually there will be so little hybrid available to breed um, that it will sort of be washed out of the general population. So we're getting close to nine. So I'm gonna do two more questions. Um, someone asked if any invertebrates were introduced with um, alternifolia. And the other question is, after such amazing progress, do you have an estimate when you'll get all of it? Uh, well, on the first question, um, Wow, wait a minute. What was the first question? I'm sorry. It was like, were, were any invertebrates, were any... Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I was trying to think about that. I don't, because no one really tracked, um, because it was an Army Corps of Engineers project in the 70s, and uh, I don't think they tracked what they were putting in the ground carefully. So, and I, I 
don't think there was any evidence. I mean, I, there's no way to know for sure. I guess that's the, sh the short answer to that is. Um, it's certainly possible. I don't know how they sourced their plants. Um, you know, and I don't know if the soil that they brought in with it had invertebrates in it. I think it's, you know, it's been too long ago now to know for sure. Don't know. And then the second one is, I don't think we know an actual end date. Um, we would if we didn't have the no treat sites that um, Lindsay referred to. Um, we're in the process of reconsulting with Fish and Wildlife Service, or we will be soon in the next year or two um, to get permission to treat those sites. If we had permission to treat everything all around the bay right now, then I'd say we could give you an endpoint easily um, as to when the project would be done. But because of that uncertainty, we don't know for sure. Well, thank you all very much for a really fascinating um, presentation and there's a lot of really interesting information in the chat thank you Brian and Jeannie especially and so if people want to save it I want to point out at the bottom of the chat there's three dots and if you click on that the first option that comes up is save the chat you can save it to your own computer so I just want to point that out you don't have to write things down you can save the chat and um, Vivian, I guess I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. If you have thanks. anything else uh, you want to say. Oh, I just wanted to say thanks to Jeannie and Lindsay and, and Brian. I And congratulations on the work. I mean, your success is just inspiring. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to hear of a restoration project that has made such incredible progress and, and actually could wrap up. I mean, that's... Amazing, wonderful, amazing. Um, and I also wanted to read something that someone said on YouTube uh, um, from Cynthia Denny. She said, I was not aware CNPS was participating in this important work. I'm thrilled to be able to access this label, level of detail on the Bay restoration with CNPS. Thank you to everyone who have contributed. And I just wanted to add my thanks to that. And also that she sort of, you know, bumped us up a level and given us a little extra sheen. So we at CMPS, thank you so much for joining us and uh, and sharing all of this, this um, amazing information and, and your work. And I'm jealous of, of all your time out there in the marsh. That looks amazing. <laughs> so um, well, we, oh, go ahead, please. I was just gonna say, well, thanks so much for hosting us. It's been fun. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And Oh, and I also want to add that we do um, put our programs up on YouTube. So if anyone's watching who thinks someone um, else might be interested in listening to this really great presentation, it, it, it will be available shortly on YouTube. So thank you. Yeah. And since it is a little bit past nine, I guess we will wrap up for the night. Um, but thank you again, Lindsay and Jeannie. And, and also Brian for all, you know, all the great information and answering all the questions and um, good luck wrapping this up because boy, this is wonderful what you've been doing. So thanks a lot, everybody. Good night. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.